you can build your first dish at any age. Uh, I got interested in radio astronomy when I read Frank Drake's book back in the early 70s, probably. And, um, but I got busy with life, trying to make a living and, you know, building a career. And so it wasn't until I retired I actually started doing something in radio astronomy. So whatever age you are, if you want a dish, get your dish. That's yeah, but you got to have a wife that will let you do that. Preston, <laughs> 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 which one do you Is want? Is this personal experience, Karen? Um, <laughs> you pick it. Okay. Oh. Is either one, really. They're just different versions. You need to figure out what to trade for the dish in the yard. There we go. That'll work. Okay, I think I'm on page 134. If you follow my report in there, actually, uh, 143. It's got a different name in there. Uh, I changed the name when I did this, and the presentation has more uh, content in it than the paper does. Uh, the longer I wrote, the more I thought of. So, uh, first of all, I want to give thanks to Jeff Lickman and Carl Leister, Radio Astronomy Supplies, Robert Ryden, and Sarah. I received help, advice, training, so uh, from various of these people. So, it you can get the help you need. If you don't know something, there's always somebody ready to help. And. Uh, Okay, uh, I did learn quite a bit, and I hope that what I learned will help somebody else to do their first dish. I'm sure all the uh, old timers already know all this stuff. Anyway, there I am with uh, my dish before the feed was installed. Uh, it's a 12 footer, the wide angle lens makes it look really big, which is great. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So I got the dish from a friend, and he's a professional dish installer. Uh, he was installing a bunch of these 12-footers like 10, 15 years ago, and he had the sections for the dish left in his warehouse. And uh, so he sold it to me at, a, at what to me was a good price. And the sections were brand new, but the mount he had had been out, laying outside and had some rust, so it had to be sanded, primed, and painted. Um, and there it is, up on cinder blocks, and that's uh, the way I worked on it. Okay, the mount was designed to be mounted on a pole, now, and to use for commercial satellites. Uh, it was designed to swing freely in azimuth, but in uh, elevation, uh, you adjust it by taking a wrench and turning some nuts. Not very practical for what I was going to do with it. And it also only covered a very narrow range. So uh, I wanted the mount, I, I needed to modify the mount so the azimuth would be fixed, pointed south, and it would move easily in elevation. So I basically needed to move the mount 90 degrees. And uh, in order to do that, uh, to set the elevation control to 90 degrees, a notch was cut in the quarter inch steel to accomplish this goal. Uh, now, there might have been some other way I could have done this, but that was the only way I saw. The notch was cut with a cutoff disc on a grinder. The steel that was cut was not part of the main support steel, so it's never a good idea to cut your main support steel. Um, anyway, I, then I drilled a hole and put a stainless steel bolt in there so this setting was fixed at 90 degrees. Now the azimuth would be fixed and the elevation would move freely. Uh, the pole to hold the mount was 12 feet long and made of quarter inch steel. It was a surplus piece of seamless steam pipe. The hole for the pole was dug five and a half feet deep using a post hole digger. Uh, I like to brag that I did that by hand. I mean, you know, <coughs> through gray clay. So it, it uh, I don't know, manual labor makes me feel like I'm tough, so what can I say? Did you lose 10 pounds digging that hole? <laughs> no. Fortunately for me, uh, we'd had a rainy spring when I dug the hole, and so 
the, the gray clay was not hard as a brick. It, it usually is. Um, anyway, so it was, the hole was five and a half feet deep. Uh, the diameter hole is three times the diameter of the pole. And some literature suggested even a larger hole. The bigger the hole, the better, because you can fill it with concrete. So um, the more concrete you have, the better it's going to hold it down. So in order, and I got this idea from uh, the professional that I purchased the dish from, that if you put a pole and you put concrete around it, uh, sometimes it can spin a little on you. And if you've got a lot of wind on your dish, the pole could spin around a little. So near the bottom of the pole, we drilled a hole and put a piece of rebar horizontally in the, in the pole. Then put the hole down in the pole and that rebar would keep the pole from rotating. Um, so anyway, so that's, that describes that. Um, okay, so then I put the pole in the hole and aligned it vertically using a level. It was held in the vertical position by ropes and stakes. And I used quick creep, uh, mainly because it was quick. <laughs> anyway, I used the directions from their website. Uh, they said put a few inches of gravel in the bottom of the hole, and I did. Um, then I put several pieces of rebar vertically in the hole to strengthen the concrete. The quick creep. I poured in the hole and allowed it to harden and cure for about a month. Uh, I think the direction said a week or two, but uh, I didn't want to take any chances. Plus, it was a month before I could get around to working on it again. So, it worked out great. Uh, my friend, Bob Ryden, or Robert Ryden, who supplied the dish, uh, I got him to assemble it for me. I'd never done it before, so... Uh, I said, hey, Bob, come on over, and he did, and he assembled on a flat piece of ground. All the sections have to exactly line up, and the bolts have to be tightened uh, that hold it together, but you don't want to tighten them so much that you actually uh, bend that soft aluminum uh, of the ribs of the dish. You don't want to, to bend it. So uh, <coughs> some guys get carried away, I know, with a wrench, and just keep on tightening. So you have to be careful about that. Okay, he had designed a tool that after it was put together, he had a tool that consisted of a boat winch and a long steel pipe. And he clamped that onto my pole and was able to hoist by cranking that boat winch. He was able to hoist the dish up and then uh, on a ladder, I guided it onto the pole as he let it down. It was kind of a neat device. It was better than hiring a crane, you know. So it worked great, and he had used this tool when he installed a bunch of these for people. Uh, but watching him, I learned the process, learned how to do it right. Um, okay. Now, after it was down on the pole, of course, we tightened the bolts from rotating the wind from coming around. But at a later date, uh, I loosened those bolts so I could line it up. Now, I, I didn't write down the website where I got the information. I think it was like the Naval Observatory or something. But I found out what, from my area, what the correction should be for the compass. So the compass would read correctly. And so I set it up with a compass so that it pointed south. And I used this sun at, you can find out the time also on some of these websites when the sun crosses a local meridian. And to check myself, I used the uh, sun shadow uh, to double check. I, I like to have, uh, I learned in engineering school that you should always have two ways to work a problem. The second way you check yourself make sure that you did in fact get the right answer so um, i'm fairly sure it's pointed south to the best of my ability anyway okay uh, my original plan was to use the uh, radio astronomy supplies 1420 fh 
buy buy them, and it, and with a choke you buy it can buy it with a choke. Uh, but on my particular dish, because L band is so uh, its horn is wider diameter than the commercial satellite frequencies, uh, I was not able to to use the choke because I had to if it separated the uh, supports more they missed the focal point. So rather than shortening those, I mean I was modifying this dish the first time I didn't want to take a hacksaw to the mounts or anything. So uh, I just didn't use the uh, the choke. Uh, hadn't caused me any problems so far. Okay. There's a picture of the cylindrical feed horn that came from Radio Astronomy Supplies. And, uh, and there it is mounted. Uh, it doesn't really look like that. <laughs> the computer has uh, done something to the photo. Um, anyway, it changed the aspect ratio because the, the horn is longer and slimmer than this. <laughs> but that's all right. There's the, there's the horn mounted in the supports. Okay, now I needed a feed horn cover. Uh, at my house, there are lots of wasps, bees, and spiders. So uh, whatever you leave outside, if you leave a tin can out there, something's gonna live in it. So uh, I didn't want them living in my feed horn, I didn't know what they would do to the reception, but I don't care much for them anyway. So, so I decided I had to have a cover. Now, I didn't know what to use. I, I, I read several things. I read some uh, amateur radio uh, information. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really find out. I got some ideas, and I decided I wanted to do a test to determine what would make a good cover. Now, I didn't have test equipment to uh, to test this at 1420, so I just decided to use my microwave oven. And even though it's a different frequency, I figured that if it heated up, I wouldn't use it. If it didn't heat up, well, it's a good chance it'd work. So, so it was kind of a, a rough test like that. So what I did was I, I got a bunch of materials together uh, like uh, bowl covers, saran wrap, all this stuff. I got it together and I started to test it. And the way I tested the microwave, I needed something to lay it on. And so I used a paper plate. Now a paper plate will heat up, but I used just a short time in the microwave so the paper plate didn't have a time to heat up noticeably. Um, Anyway, so, not really going on this. Ah, that's my second row. Anyway, so if the plastic had uh, carbon in it or trapped molecules of some kind of metal, at, metal atoms or whatever, it would heat up. So um, the time I used, I think, was about 20 seconds. And in 20 seconds, that paper plate wouldn't heat up much. 30 seconds, it would. So my test, I think, was around there. Um, let's see. I'll get on. Okay. Now, here's a second roll I wanted to go by to choose the cover. I didn't want to use a material that was thick. I wanted it to be a very small fraction of a wavelength. And I picked up a book. Oh, I can't remember which one it was now. But they said a rule of thumb was 10%. And I think that's a misprint. To me, I don't want anything uh, thicker than 1% of the wavelength because I don't want it to bother it at all. So I don't know what you microwave guys use. Do you? Depends on your frequency. If you're a very high frequency, like 23 or 38 gigahertz, it's hard to get this. <laughs> 1%, right. I, I, very good point. Okay, there we go. Um, so anyway, I wanted... It's thin, 1%. Okay, so I checked several wave sites to find dielectric constants and lost tangents to see what might work. And the one I used was the RF cafe. And according to 
these lost tangents, both polystyrene and polyethylene were very, uh, had very low loss, and one of those should be suitable. Uh, the problem is that a lot of materials you find in local stores, they don't tell you what they're made out of. If you pick up a bowl, plastic bowl cover, what's it made out of? It doesn't say. Or at least I didn't find it in it said. So, uh, I did test some plastic bowl covers. One fit perfectly over the feed horn. It would have been ideal, I thought. But all bowl covers failed the test. A uh, sheet of polystyrene gave the best results on the test. However, that sheet of hard polystyrene was hard to attach to the mouth of the feed horn. Uh, I tried one method and it, it failed. So uh, I tried saran wrap, painters drop cloths, mylar, trash bags, everything heated up as and rejected. Styrofoam was good, but it was too thick. I didn't want to use anything thick as styrofoam because that didn't meet my 1%. It, it just got a teeny bit warm in the microwave. I mean, some of that stuff uh, would get hot enough to burn you in 20 seconds. So if something just barely heated, that seemed pretty good. So my feed horn cover is a piece of can liner. But hey, whatever works, right? Okay, the LNA I used was uh, from Radio Astronomy Supplies, again, the 1420 HP. Uh, I used... Uh, now, I used underground rated CAT5E cable for control cable, and I decided to use that same type of cable to feed the LNA. If you use twisted cable, it kind of uh, cancels out a lot of the interference. The thing is, I needed 18 gauge, so I used all four pairs. Um, I used the four common wires tied together for one side of the power supply, and the other four wires tied together to the other side of the power supply. And that gave me uh, the advantage of using those twists to uh, be kind of resistant to picking up interference. And I already had the Cat 5E, so uh, when I bought it, it was burial cable had to had by a thousand feet. So I used it for a lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, the LNA had to be weatherized in some way. Uh, they were recommended building a little metal box, but the, uh, when the dish tilted, I didn't see how that metal box was really going to protect it. So I went a different route. I, I had been warned that if you just use paint on it, uh, it will not seal it sufficiently, that eventually the paint will leak. And they had had some fail that way. So. Uh, what I did was uh, cover the connectors with aluminum foil first to protect them, and then I painted the LNA with two coats of Rust-Oleum primer and let it dry after each coat. And then I encapsulated it multiple times with GE Supreme 100% silicone sunproof freeze proof. Hopefully, so far for six months, I guess I've been operating about six, seven, eight months, uh, it's lived up to its uh, claims. Uh, basically, it's caulking. <laughs> so, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, I don't know. They, they may be, I'm not saying they're not better solutions than what I did, but this is what I did and worked for me. So, Okay, here's the LNA, and it has been primed. And I took care to be sure I covered all the screws and... Uh, where the plate uh, attached and everything, any little crevice or screw was covered so that uh, there'd be no leaks there. But I left the uh, label uncovered for a while because I wanted to make sure I remembered where in and out was. <laughs> you know, it's pretty important. Uh, anyway. So there it is primed, and uh, there it is encapsulated. Uh, it doesn't look like anything. Okay, before installation, the silicone was removed from the connectors along with aluminum foil. And after the connections were made, they were sealed with coax seal and then covered with the same type of silicone. The coax seal uh, 
covered the con connection itself, but past the connection, it carried the, uh, the silicone past that coax seal, because it wouldn't stick good to the coax seal, but it sticked good to the areas just past. So, uh, anyway, after the connections, the seal was then covered the same type of silicone. After these steps and LNA was installed, I covered it with yet another layer of silicone. And th then I connected the LNA to the receiver using the CA400 cable. Uh, CA400 is about the same as LM400. Uh, it's just by a different manufacturer. Um, LM400 is recommended by a lot of people for this purpose. So. Okay, so the same guy that I got the dish from, he had this actuator laying around, and so I got it from him too. The actuator uh, that I used to move the dish in declination, elevation, uh, it's only a matter of degrees. <laughs> you have different things. Uh, somebody talked about that in their talk the other day. Anyway, so I used this actuator. It's powered by a Hingfu uh, 300 WSA 24, 24 volt power supply that I obtained from MPJA. I don't know. I received a recommendation from here last year that MPJA was a good place to order stuff from. Uh, they're out of Florida, and uh, I forget what it stands for. But, well, Marlon P. Jones. Marlon P. Jones and Associates, I guess. Anyway, uh, they are they turned out to be pretty good, got a reasonable price for that power supply. Uh, so I installed a bleeder resistor on it. It's a switching supply. I looked for a linear supply, and they cost a fortune. So I got a switching supply. I just uh, located it a long way from any other equipment. <laughs> you know, and it, uh, so hopefully, you know, I don't get any interference from it to my knowledge. Uh, okay, but I did put a bleeder resistor across it. I have heard that uh, switching supplies, maybe this is older ones, but they don't like to see an open circuit. So I don't know if that's still true or not, but it used to be true lots of years ago. So I put a bleeder resistor across there. Also, it'll discharge any capacitors because uh, it does see an open circuit most of the time. Okay, so the power supply is located indoors and I connected it to the pole by a UFB type underground cable. It's a standard underground cable uh, that an electrical supplier would use for underground circuits. It's 12 gauge times two plus ground. And the actuator is connected to the relay box by a pair of 12 gauge insulated stranded wires that I twisted together using an electric drill. I know that all of the old timers in here know that, you know, twisting and wire together helps cut down on picking up interference. So the old electric drill does a good job of it. And that's something I learned a long time ago. Cuts radiation of interference also. You have, yes. If you have a noisy source, twisted pair will radiate less. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Uh, okay. Next. This is a picture of the actuator on the dish, and you can see the red and white uh, twisted 12 gauge strand coming down from it. Where was that cut that you were talking about making the angle grinder? Uh, well, you can't really see the cut from here, but you can see the pivot point right there for the dish. That used to be the azimuth in the ounce elevation. But it's back behind that, the piece that I worked on. Okay, this is a picture of the power supply. Uh, I decided to fuse both the positive and negative uh, parts of the supply. Neither positive nor the negative is grounded, so I fused both sides just to play it safe. The relay box on the pole. I chose to use relays to control the actuator so it'd be easier to add remote controls in the future if I want to. So I have two relays in there. One enables the thing and enables power to the actuator. The other chooses whether the tilt moves up or down. Um, I did not 
uh, produce a drawing of that that I could show you, but it's it's not difficult. If but if anyone wants to see it, I can draw it on the board afterwards. But at this time, I don't have a good application to do diagrams with. So, um, okay. So anyway, I built a small wired remote control box just using a toggle switch, a push button switch, and some Cat5B cable. So I move it or empower it, give power just with the push button switch. And uh, I, I flip the toggle switch. I don't flip the toggle switch when I'm holding the power down. I don't want to... I don't want the thing to get a shock. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I didn't realize. I thought I was going to be done in 15 minutes. I really did. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a box on the pole for the relays. It's larger than what I needed, but I can do. It's got room for lots of growth. There's a small box on the right with the toggle switch and the push button switch in it. And a piece of Cat 5D runs that. So I've got a little wired remote control for the time being. Uh, okay, underground conduit. Uh, I, I wanted to put everything underground so I'd be out of the way. So uh, the power cable and the Cat 5 e cables are rated for direct burial. Uh, the coax wasn't. I decided to put them in conduit. So I got some of this all dielectric or plastic liquid type conduit. I got two conduits, one one inch in diameter, one three quarters inch in diameter. According to city requirements, the conduits had to bury 12 inches deep, so I, I dug a trench with a spade. Again, I'm proud of that. It makes me feel tough that I dug that trench. Uh, see, I am not an old geezer. <laughs> Regardless of what Tom says. <laughs> okay, before installation of trench, conduits were stretched out and pulled strings and stalled. One string was pulled the standard way using a fish tape. And uh, somebody told me, oh, don't bother with that. Just ball up a piece of paper, tie a piece of thread to it, and draw it through there with a vacuum cleaner. So yeah, I tried it. It worked. Then, of course, you take that thread and you pull a bigger string through there and you use the bigger string to pull your cables. I pulled all the cables through at the same time. Um, I pulled three cables at once. So one conduit has the coax, the Cat 5E feeding DC to the LNA, and a spare Cat 5E. And I didn't want to put the control cables in that same conduit, so I put them in a different conduit. I didn't want any chance of interference there. Of course, uh, I don't use the dish while I'm moving it, so actually it might not have been a problem, but I, I decided to keep them separate. Okay. Uh, so that's what it says there. One holds a power cable and two Cat 5E and to use as control cables. Okay, and once this cabling was installed in the conduit, the conduit was laid in a trench and covered with a layer of fine sand. That's good, especially if you have rocky soil. You don't want uh, a sharp rock under pressure puncturing through your conduit at some point. So, uh, so I covered the fine sand, then threw the dirt back in the trench and I'll throw in a story here. Where's my wife? There she is. Yeah, she's telling me to hurry up. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, when I laid the conduit in the trench, it wouldn't lay flat. So I had her stand on it while I threw dirt in there. Uh, just, uh, it didn't work. She wasn't happy enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, then I replaced the side. Uh, there's the sod. The sod looks better than the grass around it. I had worked there so much I had to reseed what was left there because I destroyed it working on it. There's the completed dish. Okay. Now, the following graphs are just a small sample of data that I've gathered. Uh, the first one shows three different hydrogen clouds, H1 clouds, moving at different speeds. The second graph shows microwave oven interference, which which is instructive if, uh, in case you have a microwave. Uh, the interference is probably due to a side load, I, d I figured out, because it doesn't happen at every angle of the dish. So I don't know what else it could be if it's not a side load. So anyway, here's the first one. Uh, to the right is blue shift, to the left is red shift, and there it is. 
three hydrogen clouds. One peak is clipped off. I lowered the gain by one dB after, after this so that they wouldn't be clipped. Uh, here we have a small uh, H1 peak to the, to the left here. I probably should be pointing with something, but I'll say I can't reach it, but there it is right there. And to the right is microwave oven interference. So it's not ET. Okay, here's just uh, four hydrogen clouds. Uh, I don't know, different arms of the galaxy, just different clouds, I don't know. But anyway, it's four clouds, and they're all red shifted by different amounts. So they're moving at different speeds different speeds away from us. Uh, here are five clouds, and they're all red shifted. Okay, here we get, have uh, one cloud red shifted and two blue shifted. And more red and blue shift together. And here's just one cloud, a nice, nice peak. It's, it's towards us, it might be moving sideways, but as far as towards us, away from us, it's almost stationary, and the width at the bottom is probably due to turbulence in the cloud. So, would that be our arm? I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't gotten into it far enough to. I know there are calculations you can do. Uh, Christ does them in his book, even that many years ago, and uh, uh, I've seen other books that do calculations, and I'm studying that, but I haven't. Haven't learned it yet. Yeah, you need to get the right ascension declination. Right ascension is easy. It's a local sidereal time at the point of sound. <coughs> declination. Uh, is that 13 degrees from the horizon? It's 13. The horizon? No, that's minus 13 degrees declination from uh, from the celestial equator. Okay. Yeah. So you subtracted that from the zenith from the latitude. Um, I don't know. I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Okay, good. And we'll find out if I did that right. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Yeah. But that one is got some turbulence in it. Okay, here's some more red shifted. Some more red shifted. And that's all. Any questions? Okay. Uh, this time. Comment. Uh, you uh, may be able to lower your side lobes on your dish if you can figure a way to put that choke ring on there. Yes. That was its purpose. Yeah, I will probably do that sometime in the future. Uh, I want to make sure it worked before I started sawing more things up. Uh, the other thing I'd like to comment <laughs> on is I'd like to compliment you on your mechanical design. It's uh, much less sloppy than mine. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Two questions. Uh, first is what is the sensitivity of this antenna and the receiver and everything from my end? The second is what was the budget for? What was the budget? For the project. Okay. Uh, Can't say that the question. Yes, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, let's see, what was it? Yeah, two questions. Remember, he said I was an old codger, so you have to ask one at a time. What was the first question? Sensitivity. Sensitivity. I have not tested it. Uh, I know that, that uh, the LNA, I think, was 0.32 or 0.36 dB, somewhere, something like that. Uh, the receivers are uh, Spectra Cyber uh, that I won as a door prize one year, a couple of years ago. And I think there's another one out there today. So, uh, if if your number's picked, I, that would be a fun thing to have. And as far as budget, uh, since I already had the receiver, I probably spent uh, on the dish and the cables and everything. I don't know, around fifteen hundred dollars. So, um, go ahead. Two questions actually. Uh, when your Cat 5 e cable, when you get your twist, do you have a common and a signal with each twist? Is that right? Yeah, well, each pair, each pair, each pair has a common. 
So I use the common from each pair to go to one side. That way I'm using the twists of the pair. And I use the the hot, if you want to call them that, to go to all to go to the other side. So uh, so the twists take a, have effect that way. There are some ways you could use them may not be as beneficial. Preston, one last question. <coughs> what did your neighbors think of this? Uh, they said this is okay. Just don't call E.T. into my yard. <laughs> That's what they told me seriously. 